Welcome to Virtual Adventure Cafe, everyone. My name is Shaheen Hakimi. I'm the director of Venture Cafe. I want to welcome you for coming to our Deep Tech Prototyping Conference in collaboration and sponsored by MIT Lincoln Laboratory. I want to set a couple ground rules from the top. Please keep yourselves on mute unless otherwise prompted by the presenters. And if you have any questions at all, absolutely feel free to drop them into the chat. I will be the background producer and we'll field them in real time or at the end for Q&A where applicable. So I want to introduce Dr. Teresa Fazio here right now. Teresa is the, pardon me, she is the, um, she's a former US Marine who's published freelance articles in the New York Times, Rolling Stones, Washington Post on foreign policy. She's the Ventures Officer at MIT Lincoln Labs and we couldn't be more thrilled to have, us, have her here with us today. Dr. Teresa Fazio, up to you. Great, thank you so much for having me, Shaheen. I'm going to share my screen really quickly and give a talk to introduce everybody to MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Let me get set up in presenter mode here. So I really appreciate you all coming to our event and, um, and learning today, and we look forward to chatting with everybody. So a little bit of history, who are we? Lincoln Laboratory started as the MIT Radiation Laboratory or the Rad Lab during World War II with the main mission to develop radar systems and technologies for air defense. It wound up designing half of all US radars used in World War II by the Allies to forewarn of German attacks. In 1951, Lincoln Laboratory was formally created with the purpose of doing research for air defense and technology development. And one of the main projects was called SAGE, the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment, that was actually spun off in 1958 to be the MITRE Corporation, which was carrying that project forward. In the following decades, Lincoln Laboratory became a driving force in the US electronics, computing, and communications industries. There we go. And in the following seven decades, we've had plenty of impact on the nation from transmitting the first television picture via satellite to creating an airborne collision avoidance system, which is installed on all planes with more than 19 passenger seats to prevent them from crashing to creating a 3D laser imaging technology that is used to assess damage after disasters like earthquakes and hurricanes to be able to devote resources where they're needed most, to the invention of 193 nanometer optical lithography, which is crucial in the semiconductor industry for mass production. So many technologies invented at Lincoln and throughout it all, we strive for impact. So what does Lincoln Laboratory look like today? Well, we're headquartered in Lexington, Massachusetts, so a short distance from MIT's main campus in Cambridge, and we have outposts throughout the world. We're a Department of Defense federally funded research and development center, but we are all MIT employees. We're funded at about a billion dollars a year, mostly from the Department of Defense, but we also do projects with outside entities and can take off contract projects too. We have about 4,000 employees. Again, we all work for MIT. So with this staff, the types of technologies that we work on um, are a broad spectrum. And we have on the left here, some fundamental enabling technologies um, such as quantum bits for quantum computing, advanced focal planes for imaging at a distance. And we take these technologies and try to get them out of the bench top and into the real world via making operational prototypes. And this is where it's really important for us to have strong collaborations with industry, whether small or large, in order to bring these prototypes out into the world. So one example is the multifunctional phased array radar tiles, which were commercialized via a license to a company called Macom. But we also invent plenty that's usable in the outside world, such as systems for measuring aviation weather, laser communications to and from space, which you'll hear a little bit about later, and different types of surveillance telescopes, among other widely varying swaths of technology. In a few minutes, you're going to hear some lightning talks from researchers in our mission divisions. We have 10. And um, the talks you'll hear today are going to be from technical staff members in Homeland Protection, Communication Systems, Advanced Technology, Cybersecurity, and actually our new Biotechnology and Human Systems Division. So I'm, I'm really excited to be able to introduce you to those folks in a few minutes. So we have really cool research going on um, with brilliant staff. And somebody earlier was asking about the types of research and development facilities that we have. So this is um, some pictures in a little slide about our microelectronics laboratory, which is located on our Lexington campus. Here are some of our beautiful clean room bays. And um, many of these facilities are used to develop technologies in graphene, silicon photonics, microelectronics, 
um, different types of microfluidics and 3D integrated circuits. Now, these, as well as the facilities on the following slide, so more laboratory research and development facilities, are available for use by US industry, universities, and governments when it doesn't interfere with Lincoln Laboratories research and when similar test facilities are unavailable in the private sector. And we do offer this for some modest fees. Uh, another facility that's available is called the Strive Center. And so that focuses on assessing human performance when using a variety of different types of technologies. And that's used mainly by our biotechnology and human systems division. We have uh, an autonomous systems development facility, which tests UAVs and various types of robotics. We have a supercomputing center, and we also have an RF systems test facility. So with all of these types of facilities at our fingertips um, and some partnering with the private sector, uh, what are some types of things that we can do? Well. Uh, it is fundamental to Lincoln Laboratory's mission as a Department of Defense federally funded R&D center that we have to strive to transfer our technologies out of Lincoln Laboratory into the real world. Congress actually imposed this requirement on FFRDCs in legislation. And this was done in order to ensure the long term competitive position of the United States, not only to make us militarily effective, but also to help give the US a competitive economic advantage which is where partnering with industry comes in, and also to use our capabilities that promote social well-being, uh, including and especially in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. So taken together, all of these things we think are vital to the national interest. Now, how has this played out in the past year or so? In fiscal year 2020, we filed almost 150 technology disclosures and had over 60 patents issued. Our technical staff members also earned eight R&D 100 awards, which are awarded to breakthrough prototype technologies. And in the past 10 years, Lincoln Laboratory has had over 60 R&D 100 awards. This is in addition to, in the past year, the many technical journal publications and published proceedings and the more academic and fundamental side of what we do. We also host about a dozen conferences a year. And we do take our mission to transfer technology out seriously also. So in the past year, we've done a government use license to a company called Skywater for our fully depleted silicon on insulator technology. And that is instrumental in making certain types of semiconductor chips. We've also spun out two companies in the past year, founded by former Lincoln Laboratory technical staff members. Um, and the first sync computing is uh, developing a computing architecture that can quickly optimize cloud infrastructure. It was funded by the engine and in about an hour and a half, uh, you will hear from the engines Orin Hoffman, uh, who is a partner there. And the second startup that I'd like to talk about is Authenticate, which is devoted to mobile cybersecurity and was also spun out of Lincoln Lab. So speaking of spinoffs, we do have dozens from throughout the years. Um, the original Digital Equipment Corporation was one of the first in the late 1950s. Then onto MITRE, which I talked about, and Coolite, which develops pressure sensors. Um, Light Lab was spun out of Lincoln Laboratory in the mid 90s, and that was created uh, in order to commercialize optical coherence tomography technology, which is instrumental to um, types of medical imaging these days. And I'd also like to highlight WaveSense, which is a Boston based startup company, uh, which licensed technology from Lincoln Laboratory that was originally developed in order to find improvised explosive devices in Afghanistan. And WaveSense is commercializing for use in the civilian sector in order to localize autonomous vehicles. So many different types of, of spin out and spin in uh, that you can do with Lincoln. So if any of the above is of interest to you, uh, please do talk to us at the Technology Ventures office. We were established a few years ago to facilitate the rapid transfer of advanced technology into and out of Lincoln Lab for the benefit of national security. And the way we do that is by transferring technologies both to our government sponsors and to the private sector at the behest of our government sponsors uh, to work with MIT's technology licensing office to shepherd intellectual property through protection. And also the entire purpose of today's uh, large event commercial engagement. So engaging with the commercial sector, especially small to medium sized companies of the type that attend Venture Cafe um, in order to support our R&D and create a transition pipeline. Our chief, Dr. Bernadette Johnson, is going to be speaking in about an hour uh, about ways to do business with us. My colleagues, Dr. Lou Belair and Jennifer Falsiglia are also on the call and I'm Dr. Teresa Fazio. And if you would like to get in touch with any of us, please do email tvo at ll.mit.edu. Um, and I would like to progress right now to some of our lightning talks. Um, and the first of which will be by Dr. Daryl Rickey, 
he is on. He is from our Biotechnology and Human Systems Division, and he is going to speak about rapid analysis of forensic DNA. I'll stop sharing right here. And Daryl should be able to share his screen when he's ready. Is it up? Do I have my screen up? You are good to go. Okay. Hello, my name is Daryl Ricky. And today I'm going to give you an introduction to the ID prison system for rapid analysis of uh, forensic DNA samples using um, um, high throughput sequencing, uh, a single nucleotide polymorphism profiles. Trying to advance here, just a second. Um, and so when an individual touches an object, they leave some DNA behind. And for our current forensic system, um, um, this works well, but when an object's been touched by more than three individuals, that's the upper limit of what they can do. So they can process samples of, of forensic samples with three or less contributors, and there's con some constraints on how much DNA those contributors have to leave behind. And so there's a bias in the forensic system to try to um, identify objects most likely touched by single individuals, such like a toothbrush, and that will give them a, a good signature that uh, they can uniquely identify. And so to get over this problem of uh, a limitation of just three individuals, we designed a new type of forensic panel, which is a panel uh, made up of multiple single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And these are the same technology used by Ancestry.com and 23andMe. In this example, we have uh, uh, an example of an A um, with, with its population frequency is 95% and a G, which is 5%. And so by picking a ratio of, of one to 20, we can basically create uh, what we call a digital barcode or a signature for an individual. And then we can actually identify when that individual contributes to a, a DNA mixture. And so to process samples, either from uh, an individual, uh, a reference sample, or a crime scene, is like a, a, a keyboard or, or any other object, um, we can basically just swab the DNA. We amplify the DNA using the standard technique called polymerase chain reaction. And then we sequence it using standard DNA sequencing technologies. And we're, this works with uh, all the major manufacturers. And then when that's done, we basically have uh, automation that will actually detect um, when the sequences are completed and the rest of the analysis is fully automated uh, into the module we call ID Prism, including detection of the, the completion of the data available. And so this system takes the data off the sequencer when it's available. It scans it basically every five minutes. It processes it to make these, these uh, individual profiles for an individual person or a crime scene sample, which we call a mixture. And then we have multiple analysis modules we apply to that. Um, if we want to compare an individual against all known individuals in the database, we call that um, identification. Uh, if we want to compare a mixture to known people, um, we call that uh, mixture analysis. Or we can take uh, a new uh, reference profile and compare it to all known uh, individuals. That's, we also call that um, mixture analysis. We can also, um, um, from the DNA profiles, tell if people are related or not. And uh, we call this kinship. And so. The, the size of the SNPs in the system um, gives us greater power. The more SNPs, the more power for the kinship, and the algorithm will do extended kinship with additional data. And then we also can pick up things called um, trace profiles. So you think of like in fingerprint technology, picking up a, a partial fingerprint, we can pick those up. And so the analysis system, uh, which we call fast ID for doing the identification and the mixture analysis, we want an R&D award for it. And that, that tool can basically take a, a reference profile or a mixture and compare it against a million uh, profiles in three seconds using one CPU on an Intel chip. And then uh, the whole system ID Prison won um, a Lincoln Laboratory Best Invention Award uh, in 2018. So taking an example here, this is a a defined laboratory mixture where we, we took DNA from six individuals and mixed them together and analyzed them with these tools. And so you have this, this kind of a, 
uh, notional representation of matching this, this signature against the mixture and asking the question, does it match? And for each of these six individuals, we can calculate the statistics for how well that match works. And so we just label these individuals A through F. And basically the statistics for each of these individuals, since they have essentially the same amount of DNA, it comes out to basically the same. And we're getting two to minus 54 for probability. So let me walk you through this. To get in court uh, a search warrant, you want a probability of roughly one in a million, which would be about one e to the minus six or, or one in a million probability. To get a conviction, you really want to be down in the, in the, in the range of one in a billion or one e to the minus um, nine. So this is one in a, uh, a billion with nine zeros. And so in this technology the example, we're down in the one to the e to the minus 54. So this is like 54 zeros. And so this is just incredibly low, low probability uh, for, the, for each of these six individuals identified in this mixture. And so this example of going um, six is, 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 is higher than current capabilities, but we can go actually higher. And so on the left, we have an example uh, where we actually design uh, a piece of fabric where our volunteers would touch it. And from that, those volunteers, we were able to identify 10 individuals who touched that mixture with the, the detection probabilities ranging from the worst being two to the e to the minus eighth. So not quite one in a billion, but all the other eight samples were basically one to the minus nine all the way to my, um, um, four to minus 25 um, for the other contributors to that mixture. And so like the, the previous example on the previous slide, we made a, a laboratory mixture of 10 individuals. And here we get very similar results to the touch mixture with a range of probabilities going from um, basically um, one tenth of one in a billion to um, uh, five to the minus 21. So here we could basically convict all 10 of these in this example of this laboratory mixture. And so 10 is kind of an upper limit for the, the, the current mixture panel we're pushing. And so um, we designed this mixture uh, with 15 as a proof of concept of when the system would break. And so uh, I don't like barriers. And so we invented a new technique to actually go beyond the upper limit. And we can actually pick up 12 of these people in this first this 15 person mixture using a special module. Uh, we call this a saturated mixture. And we're using a, a module called translucent ID to go above uh, what we call a saturation limit on, on mixtures. And so we can actually pick up uh, 12 people in that particular mixture. And so the current technologies out there are limited to roughly three. And so there's multiple tools available for the, the, the current packages and um, they have some strengths and weaknesses and such. And so they're, they're, they're quite popular in the forensic community, but um, we've got basically in, in the ID PRISM system, we got a complex uh, mixture analysis we have a relational, a relational database to store the, the reference and mixture profiles. We have full automation between the, the sequencer and the, um, and the software. And so no human in the, in the loop to do any of the analysis decisions. It's rapid, it's scalable. We do automatic kinship detection for the reference profiles. We automatically handle the saturated mixtures and we can actually do network analysis, which I, I didn't show you an example of today. And so here's my contact information and we'll see if there's a question or two. Thank you very much, Daryl. Really appreciate it. Um, and at the end of all of the lightning talks, hopefully we'll have a few minutes for questions before our 305 break. Next up, I would like to introduce Dr. Nathan Burrow, who is uh, from our cybersecurity and information systems division. And he's going to talk about the resilient mission computer. Thank you, Teresa. Is this the correct slide view that I've shared? Yep, you are good to go. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, as Teresa mentioned, I'm Nathan, and I'm going to be talking to you about our Resilient Mission Computer Project, um, which really grew out of an effort to look at the cybersecurity landscape and how we got to the less than ideal situation that we're in today, and think about how we could develop fundamental new technologies to change that. Okay. So to illustrate the state of the world in cybersecurity today, um, at the top left, you can see the US government budget for cybersecurity in billions has been increasing steadily year over year in the last decade. Um, at the same time, however, 
uh, number of software vulnerabilities, uh, both in the number of abilities, vulnerabilities reported to what's called the CVE database, as well as in terms of um, data records stolen and data breaches have both been increasing and particularly for data breaches exponentially so. And these attacks are increasingly attributed to nation state actors and are more and more sophisticated in the methods that they're using. And so despite our scale and significant investment in cybersecurity, the attacks you know, continue to worsen every year. So we went in the back and looked at how did we get here? Um, so sort of to do a history of computing in a nutshell, going back to the 60s, they were the original fundamental projects that came out of World War II and their follow-ons such as Multics at MIT and Project Mac. And these were really, you know, the next best thing from vacuum tubes, so very early digital computers, resources were scarce, disk space was a problem, there was very little memory, just trying to build something that would work and do useful things was still a significant challenge. Computers were the size of rooms, et cetera. And as time progresses, we got better and better at building these and they became smaller and smaller until you, when you get to the 90s and there's a real focus on commoditization, processor, you know, Moore's Law is in full effect, processors are doubling in speed every year, People are using the most general languages possible that are you know, just one step above directly talking to the hardware because they're giving them performance and scale. The problem is that none of these have security baked into them at all. It's all about performance and doing the most useful computation possible and commoditization. Um, so only when you get to the 2000s does DARPA begin to have problems looking at, or excuse me, programs looking at built-in defenses for computation. And only when you get to 2020 does the National um, Federal Cybersecurity Research and Development Strategic Plan start to call out a need to design for security. Um, and so really we've reached a state of the world where we need a fundamental redesign for security if we're going to reduce cyber attack vulnerabilities. Um, so when we're thinking about how we might do this fundamental redesign, there are three pillars that we're building on. Um, the first is the advent of safe programming languages. Um, these are transitioning out of the resource, excuse me, out of the research community. Um, the Firefox web browser, as well as Google's Chrome browser, um, both are partially translated to new safe languages that have been developed. Um, Microsoft and Amazon are also using these languages in products that are used by you today, um, whether you realize it or not. Um, at the same time, the hardware vendors, um, Intel and ARM being the two key ones for the desktop and mobile environments respectively, are starting to create hardware that's not only focused on performance and computation, but also security. So they're giving us new hardware security primitives that are very secure as they're baked into the silicon that we can use as we attempt to design and build new, more secure systems. And really the third pillar of these and that really combines the first two that I just talked to um, is fine grain compartmentalization. Uh, so designing systems with the idea that something may go wrong in some component, but keeping the components as isolated as possible and looking very strongly at how they interact with each other to try to prevent vulnerabilities from spreading. So here's a slide um, with sort of our entire architecture laid out. Um, there are a few things to note that it goes all the way from the applications, which are things like you know, Word or an app on your phone that you're using, through the libraries that do things like cryptography and image rendering for you. Um, the operating system that's responsible for interacting with the hardware on behalf of everything else so that your application developer doesn't have to know how to interact with the hardware. That's the operating system's responsibility. And then the processor itself using these um, new security features, which are commonly referred to as tagged processors. Um, so we've really been focusing on the layers between these. Um, the orange boxes show some new technologies that we have developed. Um, in total, we have five inventions, two open source software releases, and numerous papers that we're in the process of further maturing the technology on. But the um, technology that I wanted to highlight um, for you today out of this you know, moonshot vision effort is around compartmentalizing the operating system. 
Um, and we're really focusing on the operating system because as you can see here, it's the last layer above the processor. And so it's the software layer that is most fundamental to the security of the entire system. Uh, if you can compromise the operating system, you compromise all applications, et cetera, that are running on top of it. So having it be secure is really, you know, the cornerstone of the key pin towards having an entirely secure system. Uh, so when compartmentalizing an operating system, on the left-hand side, you see the state of the world today with what uh, we in the business refer to as monolithic operating systems. Uh, what this means is that there's one big happy family operating system that has your file system, your networking, that knows how to talk to your ethernet driver, your Wi-Fi driver, all of these are lumped together and for all intents and purposes, the same thing, which means that a vulnerability in any of them compromises the entire operating system and thus the entire kernel. So this is terrible from a security perspective. Um, although historically it was great because it was performant and you know, really this model got us where we are today, but it needs to be changed. Um, the first step in changing it um, are what are known as microkernels, which try to pull as many OS features as they can out and have them be uh, more secure and really run as separate user space applications. And you can do this for many things, but there are some fundamental operating system functions that you really can't pull out under this design paradigm. And so what we're advocating for is moving towards a new operating system structure where everything, including the fundamental pieces that the microkernel couldn't compartmentalize, um, are actually compartmentalized with the help of the new, um, more security aware processors, um, particularly from ARM. Um, so we're calling this hardware assisted kernel compartments. Um, so to illustrate what we're attempting to do here, um, on the top right hand side, you can see Linux where you have your networking stack and you know, Bluetooth, your file system and ethernet driver. And as I mentioned, all of these can talk to each other you know, unlimitedly. And so we're trying to put each of these in their own sandbox, so to speak, so that the Bluetooth system is contained and an error in it can't affect your file system and an error in your file system can't contact your, uh, excuse me, can't infect your ethernet driver. Um, of course, there are going to be some desired interactions and we allow for these, for instance, your ethernet driver here might want to talk to NF tables, which is a packet filter. So it's used for implementing things like firewalls and then you know, on up through your, IP network stack to actually get the network traffic into your application. Um, and the challenge for us has been doing these with the actually commercially available um, processors, which have a limited number of tag bits. Um, in particular, many of them like to have four tag bits, which means that there's you know 16 pieces, so two to the fourth, four tag bits, 16 pieces of information um, that you can use for security purposes. So you could use these and say, okay, well, we're going to have 16 compartments and everything would work fairly nicely, um, but you want to have many more compartments than that. And that's what we've really shown how to do. And particularly, we're building a proof of concept of doing this on top of the ARM system, which is commonly used in um, embedded systems. All your phones have ARM chips in them, et cetera. Really anything that isn't a laptop or a server is very likely running an ARM chip. Um, so we've done this with some proof of concept boards, which you can see um, pictured here, including everybody's favorite, you know, quadcopter demonstration, because who doesn't like to see a quadcopter flying around, which are you know, much more excited than the other printed circuit boards. Um, so in conclusion, there are multiple novel RMC technologies that are ready for transition. There are three patents pending. These are things that are ready for licensing. Um, there's our hacks process that we'd love to collaborate with people on to see what their use cases and needs are for. Um, so what we're you know, hoping to get out of this interaction um, are potential sponsor, our potential partners for licensing technologies um, to work with through the CRADA mechanism, um, co companies to you know, do joint development on technology and see how we can further develop and adapt our ideas um, for use cases in the commercial sector. Uh, our contact information is here and we'd be happy to take any questions um, here at the end of the presentations when we call for those or in the chat in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan, that was terrific. Really appreciate it. 
Um, next up is Dr. Kurt Scheeler from our Communication Systems Division, and he will be talking about optical communications from space. Okay, can you see my slides? Great. Yes, All right, so I'm, I'm Kurt. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the uh, T-Bird project. T-Bird stands for Terabyte Infrared Delivery. And so what we want to do with this is we want to use laser communication to move huge amounts of data across large distances. Think uh, you know, space to Earth or Earth to space. And uh, so as a little motivation um, for the space to Earth scenario, uh, there are uh, many satellites that are being built right now or, or existing in orbit that are able to generate uh, huge, huge data volumes um, because of their uh, exquisite sensors, um, be it you know imaging applications or synthetic aperture radar. Um, so uh, there are some examples here of different satellites, um, and it, and uh, you know there are large satellites that can that can generate up to 30, uh, 30 you know 10, 10, 10 to thirty terabytes per day. There are, there are also small satellites that are that are generating huge amounts of uh, raw data volume, and so um, the. The, the issue is uh, that the way that these systems have to get down um, these large amounts of data today is that they use radio frequency communication links. And so when uh, with radio frequency communication, um, there's, there's a data rate bottleneck. So there's, there's basically a limited amount of, of spectrum that, that, uh, that has to be uh, shared and it constrains the data rates that you can operate at. So typical systems today, um, might, might be able to operate at, at, say, up to a gigabit per second. And because of this constraint, um, uh, the way that, they, that systems try to get down data volumes like terabytes per day is that they have to um, uh, build large uh, um, dishes on the ground, and many of them, to form a network. And uh, they also have to do compression of their data on board the satellite. And, uh, and this can, can result in uh, you know, a sacrificing quality of their data. So, um, so what we wanted to do with, uh, so the idea with, with T-Bird is to use laser communication. And laser communication has essentially unlimited spectrum uh, available. So it's not constrained like radio frequency is. And this makes it possible to operate at extremely high data rates, uh, 100 to 1,000 times faster than the radio frequency systems. And so the, the idea with T-Bird in particular was to, uh, to leverage some some of the technology that's um, some of the technology breakthroughs in the fiber telecommunications industry. So uh, about 10 to 15 years ago, there was a there was a revolution in the fiber telecommunication uh, field um, where they they started making devices called coherent modems that are basically able to operate at 100 gigabits per second over thousands of kilometers of fiber. So on the upper left here, there's some a picture of of uh, some of these um, modems. Uh, they're they're very small. They can fit in the palm of your hand. And when you when you uh, connect two of them together by by an optical fiber and you add an amplifier, you can you can do error free communication at 100 gigabits per second. So 100 gigabits that's a huge number. Um, so hard to wrap your head around. Uh, one way I like to think about it is it, it's sort of like being able to to transfer the entire storage of an iPhone in just a few seconds. So so very fast. And so with T-Bird, we wanted to, to leverage this technology and, and apply it to free space links, uh, where you're not operating, you're not communicating over a fiber optic channel anymore, but you're, you're going over free space. And, and the problem is that um, if you just take these devices and you hook them up to a telescope and you try to operate uh, over, over uh, certain channels, um, uh, it, basically your signal strength can, can fluctuate all over the place and, and it causes your, your, your data to drop out. It's kind of like having a, a lousy Zoom connection. Um, so uh, one example of uh, sort of an illustration of, of what's going on here is if you go out on a clear day and you look up at the sky, you'll see the stars twinkling. And these stars twinkle because of atmospheric turbulence. And it's the exact same phenomenon that makes our signal strength sort of twinkle and, and uh, you know, move in and out and, and makes us lose data. And so the thing we did with T-Bird was we augmented these, these commercial transceivers into a modem that can, that can operate uh, reliably and error-free over, over channels that, have, um, that involve the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so, so there's a picture of, uh, of one of these augmented modems on the right there. Um, and it, it, it recently won a, uh, an R&D 100 award. 
So just a little bit um, uh, more about about these term uh, about these augmented modems. So uh, the picture that you're seeing that's about the size of a football, and um, for for terminal for laser comm terminals that go into space, this is extremely small. Um, and uh, what you see in these in the in the pictures here are the different building blocks that you would need to, to build a laser communication system. And you, you can see that at the, the T-Bird terminal, it, uh, it, it, it's, it comprises some of these blocks, um, but you, you would also need an amplifier to make your signal uh, stronger and you need a telescope to actually um, transmit out light or to receive light. Um, but the idea is that, that uh, depending on, on what kind of link you want, link geometry you have, you, you could be talking from from an airborne platform up to space or from space to ground, uh, that will affect how you build your telescope and your amplifier. The idea is that you can always have this, this kind of this T-bird modem behind it um, that would allow you to, to operate um, error free. And so, uh, so, so we, we built up this, this terminal and we did a field test with it. Um, about a year, a year or two ago now, where we uh, we paired it with a, a simple telescope, and then we we did a a a, a, a link a, uh, across the atmosphere uh, here at Lincoln Laboratory, um, and it was about three kilometers of atmosphere um, over a over a horizontal link that was flat flat along the ground, not going up to space. Um, but basically, during that demonstration, we, we showed that we could achieve error-free 100 gigabit per second communication even in the presence of of atmospheric turbulence and fading. Uh, so we're not done. The, the very exciting thing that we're doing right now is we're, we're building a payload um, to, to go on a, uh, a satellite um, and be launched into space to do a, to, to do a, a flight demonstration um, of this. So um, what we're doing is we're, we're, uh, there's going to be a, a CubeSat, which is basically like a shoebox sized um, satellite and it's it's going to be launched into low Earth orbit, which is a few hundred kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And um, so, in a in in a few minutes uh, of that satellite going over over the Earth over our over our ground station, we'll be able to operate at 200 gigabits per second and and be able to deliver a terabyte of data in, in just a five minute pass. So we're building up that that payload right now, and uh, we're also building up. A, a ground station that's going to act as the receiver, and uh, I should mention that this uh, this demonstration is, is sponsored by NASA. Uh, NASA is really looking forward to, to the results of this demonstration because they have a lot of satellites um, whose whose sensing capabilities are increasing, and, and you know the data is only uh, becoming more prevalent, and they, they they need ways to get down lots and lots of data. Uh, so that's that's what I have for today. Um, just a quick summary. Uh, we're, T-Bird is trying to enable extremely high bandwidth, error-free communication over free uh, a variety of different kinds of free space links. We're, we're doing this by leveraging uh, some huge advances in the telecom industry and the fact that optical spectrum is unlimited. Uh, and, and my contact information is there as well. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Kurt. Really, really interesting technology. This is fantastic. Um, so next up, I would like to introduce Mr. Pierre Dufilly, who is from our Advanced Technology Division, and he's going to speak to us about lightweight deployable array panels. So continuing with the space theme for today. As uh, Teresa mentioned, my name is Pierre Dufilly. Um, I'll be talking to you today about lightweight deployable array panels. Uh, these are essentially very lightweight antenna arrays that can be used in communication systems, radar, and sensing systems in general. Uh, but one uh, area where they're very important is in outer space. Uh, Space-based communications and sensing systems, they've been moving towards large constellations of satellites. And typically we use the phased arrays to electronically steer energy beams. And the panel size is a function of the, the gain, the beam width, and the link budget that we're trying to achieve. Uh, so we generally, we, we like to use large arrays, but they're usually very heavy. So the challenge in creating these large satellite constellations becomes one of uh, cost mostly, as each launch is very expensive. So we want to be able to fit multiple phased array satellites in the launch systems. And one system that could be used here is the Esperang, shown here on the figure on the right. It has six bays that can each house a satellite. 
and it can either be used as a bus where the payloads remain attached or a ride where the payloads are, are separated after the launch is complete. Uh, but each of the bays has a weight and a volume restriction that we have to meet, which makes for interesting problems. Uh, commercial applications for the lightweight panels, uh, you could use them in space-based radar imaging of Earth, such as ICI shown on the left. Uh, one potential use for this is climate change investigations. Um, they also, uh, in particular, they're important in, in that they reduce the weight and the cost of the system. Um, and also, in addition to that, we can implement things like dual polarization, uh, which can also help at looking at weather changes. Uh, it's important to note that space is not the only area where they, where they can be used. Um, they can also be used in uh, air-based radar imaging systems. Uh, for example, radar imaging of disaster areas, that's an important area. Uh, they have significant space and, and volume constraints there as well. So let's have a look at the uh, technology. Uh, looking at the uh, space-based systems out there already, uh, there's Terrasar X, Radar Set 2. Um, they're fairly heavy systems on their own. And it's important to note that the antenna array itself is a significant portion of the total launch mass. So we'd like to do the same job as these systems, uh, but we want to get the weight down in order to be able to take advantage of uh, the launches that can create the satellite constellations in a cost-effective way. So in order to fit on uh, an ESPA-type launch, uh, a phased array satellite system would have to fit within one of those bays shown on the previous slide. It would have to have a mass density that's roughly five to 10 times lower than what we've done in the past. And so looking at the types of technologies we've seen in the past, uh, SLAT arrays, they've been around for a very long time. They're shown on the left. Uh, this is part of the SPY-6 system. Uh, they have many, many trays that are lined up in a, in a housing perpendicular to the interface. And the advantage for these types of systems is that you have a lot of depth available, uh, but it ends up costing you in the weight uh, in order to produce it. So this was necessary back when the electronics were much larger, but now we have electronics that are much smaller. So we've gotten away from SLAT architectures uh, on the left and we've implemented panel architectures like the MPAR system shown in the center uh, for which we won an RD100 award back in 2011. Uh, by changing from the SLAT format to the tiled panel approach, we reduced the weight and the cost by about a factor of five, uh, which is very significant. And then beyond that, we wanna go even uh, farther to the right for space and airborne applications uh, in order to reduce the weight further. So um, in order to meet the low mass requirements for the launch, we have this lightweight panel technology on the right. And for this, we won an RD100 award in 2019. So here's what we're doing in this technology. Uh, we have all the layers in a phased array system, which are very standard, uh, but there are three that are enabling in terms of significantly reducing the weight. Uh, the most important is using what we call a uh, castellated substrate in the radiator. Uh, the lower substrate's thickness is primarily dictated by the bandwidth that's, that the uh, system needs. And there's typically a minimum that's required. So we performed some detailed analyses and we found that instead of sacrificing the bandwidth, we could reduce the mass of the radiator by carefully removing the material in between the elements in a way that didn't impact the performance. And so another area of interest here in the system is the beam former or the uh, distributed signal layer. Uh, optimizing the weight by using thinner substrate layers uh, led to a design where we had higher losses, but uh, but that was in exchange for reducing the weight. And we overcame uh, this problem by adding additional amplification into the system where we needed it. And this all fit within our power budget and our weight budget. And then the third enabling la uh, layer in the system is the thermal radiator at the bottom. It's basically a challenge of using state-of-the-art materials. And here we use a material called Stable Core by Cyrix International. It's a, a, com a carbon composite laminate and it's primarily used just to spread and radiate the heat away from the structure. Uh, instead of using um, uh, boards, which would be, you know, a metal structure, which would be much heavier. And so with the uh, lightweight panel technology, we've gone to about one-tenth of the thickness of the MPAR panels that I showed on the previous slide. 
And we accomplished this by using very tight integration, pushing for very thin layers anywhere that we could, and removing material where we could from layer thicknesses, uh, i.e. the castellated substrate that was mentioned. In MPAR, uh, there's also airflow channels, which is not really an option in outer space. Uh, so we have the thermal radiator on the bottom. And so we're going to this very thin stack up that has many challenges that goes with it, uh, but it does comply with all the standard printed circuit board uh, manufacturing techniques. So looking at the, uh, the radiator or the antenna more closely, on the left is the standard approach to a stack patch antenna array. It uses a solid lower substrate, all solid materials. And so we took a look in simulation. We found that by removing material in these uh, cross-shaped areas in between, uh, we could reduce the weight significantly, about a third of it easily, uh, without impacting the scanning performance of the array. Uh, it also allowed for a contiguous layer, meaning that you could you could hold the, the entire layer uh, by means of these interconnecting tabs, and that's in the vertical and horizontal planes. And it turns out that they're, uh, they're required there to maintain the performance. That's when you start to hurt when you remove it. So we, we received a patent for this approach. Uh, it was granted back in March of 2019. So in summary, we designed a new lightweight panel technology. Our uh, new panel is about five times more compact and six times lower in mass density compared to the, uh, the current phased array satellite approaches. And we verified the performance of our design with prototype hardware. We were very happy with the results. And we got a patent for the technology back in March of 2019. And further work on this would involve integration of active circuitry. Uh, there's shock and vibration testing that would need to be done, other environmental testing in general. Uh, and we're also, we welcome transition partners, of course. And I wasn't the one, uh, only one to work on this project. There are many people involved, so I just wanted to acknowledge all their efforts here. And uh, my contact information is below if you'd like to get in touch. I'll also take any questions at the end of the presentations. Great, thank you so much, Pierre. Um, there was at least one question in the chat for you, so you can either answer that in chat or we can talk about it in a few minutes. Um, right. Because our final presentation during the lightning talks will be by Dr. Jonathan Sue from our Homeland Protection and Air Traffic Control Division. And he will speak about neural networks. Um, so I will give it to Dr. Sue to take it away. Thank you, Teresa. I'll share my screen. Uh, so yes, my name is Jonathan, and I'm going to be talking about uh, something we call This Looks Like That. Uh, it's a technique that we've developed for uh, trying to make neural networks uh, understandable. So of course, there's been an explosive growth in artificial intelligence and machine learning in the last few years. And a lot of that growth has been driven by deep learning and convolutional neural networks. You may have seen uh, applications where one can take an image, feed it into a neural network, and the network will tell you what kind of animal it thinks is in the picture. Uh, a nice property of these networks is that they're able to learn good features during training. So the first layers of the network extract features, and then the last layer classifies uh, what it thinks the input is, and they're able to achieve state-of-the-art accuracy, uh, in some cases even superhuman accuracy on some problems. A drawback of these networks is that they're sort of the ultimate black box algorithm. They're very hard for us to understand what they're doing. Um, and there are applications where uh, the users won't use artificial intelligence if they don't understand what it's doing because they don't trust it. So that, that property has led to a lot of work in so-called post hoc explanation of neural networks. In that case, uh, one leaves the network design and training unchanged and tries to show uh, which pixels uh, on the input image had a strong influence on the output. So you might get something like this. You may have seen things like this. Um, and it seems to work pretty well until it doesn't work. Network makes a mistake and your postdoc explanation is still highlighting that, hey, the network is looking at the right place. Um, and part of the problem is that really one's using a black box to try to explain the original black box. And some other re research on postdoc methods has actually shown that they can be misleading uh, or they can even be deceived or misled. And why does this happen? Why do these postdoc explanations fail? Uh, it's really, I would say because the networks weren't designed to be interpretable. They're really just trying to optimize the accuracy. So in the work we did, we took an alternative approach. We intentionally designed the network to use an interpretable model. 
that's the model that's constructed intentionally uh, to be understandable by humans. That does require us modifying the network uh, architecture and the training objective. We replace the classification layer with a, a new layer. Um, and that means you can use this technique with a pre-trained CNN that you can find online. Uh, and admittedly, this does not make the entire network um, interpretable, but we're working at the highest level of the features that are being used to make classification. And as we'll see, uh, our network is able to achieve competitive accuracy while also providing interpretability. The work I'm talking about was a successful collaboration uh, with Cynthia Rudin and her students at Duke University. Um, and this was published at NeurIPS, one of the top machine learning conferences. And it was chosen as a spotlight, pa spotlight paper, which is an uh, honor reserved for the top 3% of submissions. So we're using a principle of explanation called case-based reasoning using parts. When we're given a test image of a bird, we want to know what kind of bird it is. Our model looks for prototypical parts that it's seen during training, and then it uses them to make a prediction. So essentially what it's doing is it says, well, this part of the input image looks like that part that was seen during training, and it came from a clay-colored sparrow, and so forth for other parts of the input image and other parts that were learned during training. When we see enough of these uh, similarities, we predict the appropriate class. So in this case, we'd call this a clay-colored sparrow. So we're really comparing test image patches to prototypical parts that we learned during training. We know which class those training patches came from, uh, so we can choose which class to make a prediction for. Regarding the network training, um, it, and a lot like traditional um, image recognition networks, we have a set of training images, and each one has a class label. Uh, we have a design parameter, which is the number of parts we want per class. And then during training for each class, we learn parts that are similar to some part of the correct class and different or far away from parts for the other classes. We also learn the usual kinds of weights that you would learn when training a CNN. So on the right here, uh, I've shown some of the prototypical parts that were learned uh, on a bird data set that has 200 different species of birds in it. We, have, we learned 10 parts per class. And one thing I want to point out about our training is that we don't require any part annotation or part labeling. The training process learns the parts automatically. So when our network is given an image and goes to make a prediction, um, what it's doing is it's taking the input image and it's comparing regions of it um, with all the prototypical parts from all of the classes. And these prototype activation maps here are showing how similar that region of the input image is to some uh, prototypical part. We take the maxima of all of these similarities and we compute a weighted sum of them for each class. And then we pick the class that has the highest score. So what's really important here is that our network is really looking for the parts. And then it really uses what it finds to make its prediction. How does our network perform? Uh, I'm showing performance on this 200 class per data set. And these blue bars show conventional non-interpretable CNNs. And these green bars show the performance for the same network where we replace the classification layer with our interpretable model. And you can see that for some, some CNNs, we perform a little bit better. Uh, for some of the other ones, we perform quite, not quite as well. And then there are other ones where we perform almost exactly uh, the same. Uh, but the key takeaway here is that we have a model that has competitive accuracy with conventional non-interpretable neural networks, but our model is interpretable. That means we can provide a faithful explanation for what's going on. Uh, a user can form a mental model that's consistent with the prediction process that the network is doing because our network is really looking for the parts and it's really using them to make its prediction. And I'll emphasize again that we learn the parts automatically without the need for any part level labeling. Um, so this opens up a lot of exciting opportunities. Um, one area we could see this work being developed is just making better interfaces for interacting with and visualizing the prototype parts and what was detected. Uh, I've also emphasized that our training doesn't require um, any parts. It learns the parts automatically. But if we had a collection of annotated parts uh, provided by experts, we could use those to see the training uh, or use them as anchors, for example. And one area where we see this kind of work being particularly useful are in high stakes applications where your experts have to trust the AI before they'll adopt it. And in fact, my uh, collaborators at Duke University are now taking this work. They're working with radiologists at Duke Medical Center 
uh, to the problem of making predictions uh, from mammograms. So that's one exciting area where we're taking this work. Uh, but there certainly are other ones that might be possible. So if you're interested in learning more, please do reach out to me. Uh, if you have a great application in mind, reach out to me. Um, if you'd like to just learn more about the paper, I have a reference down here for it, uh, as well as a link to the GitHub code. Thank you. Hey, Jonathan, thank you so much. Um, so for a couple of the folks who just presented, we do have some questions in the chat. And I, I'm going to keep you on if you don't mind, because I just saw one related to your talk. And it was how many hidden layers did your group use in this experiment that you're describing? Uh, we used a variety of um, pre-trained networks, so like VGGNet, uh, DenseNet, anywhere from 121 to, I think, 141. So the pre-trained networks, you could have hundreds of layers, um, but then our network only has about three layers. We basically translate the, um, the feature vectors that come out of the front end network that we're using. We do some remapping of those, and then we learn some classification weights. Okay. So we have we add about three layers to an existing network, effectively. And um, from the same person, I'm not going to presume that you are in the mind of Google researchers, but there was a question as to why Google spent years back in the 2000s to train their neural network to recognize a cat when a toddler could do the same thing. Um, any comments or thoughts as to the progression of, of neural networks um, in the past 20 years or so? Uh, I think um, net neural networks are data hungry, and so you go where you can get data. And um, so that's that's I, what I would I would say. There's probably a lot of data people taking pictures of their of their cats and and dogs. Right. No, that makes sense. Um, there's been another question for you. Most of the other folks are answering theirs in the chat, but since you're in the hot seat here, um, <laughs> somebody is asking if you only work on conv uh, CNNs, convolutional neural networks, or do you also work on RNNs? And if you have any papers to recommend for disease prediction. Um, I have not been working with RNNs. There are people at the laboratory that work at them. Um, in fact, we, we, uh, there is some nice work uh, from another university where they took what we did and they applied it to um, working using the same technique for time series using RNNs. Um, and I can certainly provide you some references uh, if you reach out to me. OK, fantastic. Thanks. Um, so we do have a question for uh, Dr. Scheeler. Kurt, if you're on, uh, there's a question as to what wavelength T-Bird is designed for. If that's something you can share. Uh, sure. Yeah. So the wavelength is um, is in the optical C band, which is 1.5 microns. Okay. Straightforward. Thank you. And there was a question about cloud attenuation, but I believe you answered it right. Yeah, clouds are always a, an issue with free space laser com. But if you if you put multiple ground terminals, then you can increase the probability that one of those ground terminals is is available. Okay, fantastic. Um, and if there are any more questions, please do feel free to type them into the chat. And if folks have requests for contact information, um, I know I've, I've typed it before, but the TVO is just tvo at ll.mit.edu. And I'll type that in again if folks want to follow up uh, with us. We do have about five minutes here left before our 10 minute reset break, uh, if anybody's got more questions. Um, and at 3.05, Dr. Bernadette Johnson will be talking about the different types of contracts that we do and ways that small businesses can work with Lincoln Laboratory. So some of the questions that have been answered might or asked already um, and answered in the chat might again be spoken about in that talk in a little bit more depth. Actually, that's 3.15, Teresa, not 305. I'm sorry. You're totally right. <laughs> <laughs> I did not just bump you up 10 minutes. Um, our break is at 3.05 in case anybody has questions. Or we can just hang out. That's cool too. Yes. Um, so which office that presents our IP portfolio? Do you mean, uh, I'm, I'm assuming represents. So uh, we collaborate closely with the MIT Technology Licensing Office. Uh, and I think at least one of their members is also on the call. So our intellectual property is, um, we intake it at Lincoln Laboratory and then uh, the TLO on campus uh, hires the lawyers that file our patent applications. They're the ones who actually do the negotiations for the licensing deals, but we collaborate closely with them every step of the way. 
Uh, and there is also a question as to whether Lincoln ever offers public tours of the Haystack facility in Westford. And in the interest of full disclosure, I joined Lincoln during COVID, so I have not gotten my full tour. So um, maybe Bernadette or one of the other team members can, can answer that. But I know there have been uh, plenty, there's lots on our website. I'll put it again in the chat uh, in terms of pictures and virtual tours and things like that. Yeah, I don't personally know whether we offer public tours. We do it infrequently at the main laboratory, but uh, it's something to find out. Yeah, definitely feel free to check out our website for um, photos and videos and, and things. It is great that we've got about, uh, well, 130 now, but I know I saw 153 folks on the call uh, at first. Um, okay, so we have a question as to how do we find out if patents published by MIT are available for licensing and who do we need to contact? And that is a terrific question. And you can contact us in the TVO or the Technology Licensing Office. Um, if you notice something, say, on Google Patents and you want to see if it's available or something like that, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm not sure if you can clarify if the licensing office at MIT is open to startups as well, but if you are somebody who is intending to create a startup and would like to license uh, MIT owned technologies to do that, that is something people do. The technology licensing office does vet people to um, make sure that you know, they, they are the appropriate folks to, to be doing this and that they have proper like credentials and background and um, you know, investment to be able to do it. So there is due diligence done, but people absolutely do that. And we have had uh, in sort of a foundry style model, outside parties license both Lincoln Laboratory and MIT in general technology in order to create a company solely around it. So that does happen if that was the intent of that question. Um, and no, there, okay, great, thanks. Uh, and there is no time limit to commercialize IP from Lincoln Laboratory. Um, Aside from, you know, if there's an issue patent, patents are good for, for 20 years. Uh, but, uh, but no, we don't put like a hard and fast limit when somebody discloses something to us, an inventor. Oh, and Neela, thank you from our um, tech comm office, our, uh, our communications office has, um, has shared uh, that MIT's side of Haystack does offer an open house twice a year. So hopefully post COVID, this can be an opportunity for you folks. Okay, so does Lincoln Lab have an advising service to startup companies on the technology that they are developing, not originally from Lincoln Laboratory? So I'm assuming, and John, if you can clarify this question maybe in the chat, um, if this is uh, consulting or something like that, we, we do collaborative R&D agreements. Um, you know, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not sure whether you mean if that's like a spin out or if you have a startup. Uh, oh, an advisory mentorship. Okay, so um, not exactly. If you are an MIT startup from the MIT side of the house, there is the venture mentoring service. Um, and our staff members, uh, you know, can do a, say, a collaborative uh, research project or something like that, where they can offer technical input. Um, but no, we, we don't mentor startups from, from the inside out. No. Uh, but MIT campus does have plenty of resources along those realms, especially if you are affiliated with MIT. And I guess this is why Venture Cafe exists too, so folks can find mentors. So I'm sure there are folks on the call uh, who can mentor and advise in, in different fields. But thank you, it's a good question. Good question. So and I, I will drop a yes. link to our office hour program so people can get Perfect. their ideas off the ground as well. Um, and it sounds like, Teresa, it might be fruitful to have someone from your team on there. People definitely have questions for you. It, it looks like it, yeah. Um, so I know we are at the break right now. Uh, so, and I know there are a couple more questions, um, which if we don't get to in the next 10 minutes, uh, we definitely can roll those into immediately after Dr. Bernadette Johnson's talk. Um, but real quick, uh, yes, we do R&D collaborations with startups. We can also... Um, be a partner on, uh, if you get an SBIR or STTR grant, we can fulfill the research partner portion of that. Um, enlisting us as a teaming partner for a DOE, ONR, or ARF, AFRL proposals, I will punt that to a question for after uh, Bernadette's um, talk because it may be slightly complex. 
Um, but Bernadette can answer that question uh, much better. So uh, that is a, a good and valid question. And the answer is hashtag it's complicated. Um, <laughs> but it is, it's a very good question. And it's one we get a lot. So um, fantastic. So um, all right, I think we'll be back with Bernadette in nine minutes now. And uh, yeah, but thank you all so much for, for your deep attention. And you know, feel free as more questions come up to type them in the chat and we will definitely get to them in the next session.